Good morning, everyone, and welcome to University Unitarian Church in Seattle, Washington. It's Sunday, November 1st, and my name is John Luopa. I'm the senior minister here and delighted to welcome you this morning virtually from not only the greater Seattle area, but all over the country. I am here today with our music staff, Dwight Beckmeyer, our pianist, and our scheduled uh, soprano soloist, Jenny Spence, was feeling a little under the weather and so decided to stay home this morning, which was the right decision. And of course, with our tech crew. We are at the uh, crashing point almost of a big election day next Tuesday. So many of us have been following this, working for it, wondering and worrying about it, no doubt. We have many activities scheduled here at UUC over the weekend and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday uh, for you to uh, take advantage of if you want a small or a large group, a more meditative style, a more action planning event. And we encourage you to go to the website or to the e-news for that schedule. Let me just lift up, if I may, two of those possibilities for you. We have a number of breakout groups every Sunday during our fellowship hour. And we will continue this week with our UU The Vote a breakout group, but with a little different twist this morning. And this is for those of you who are uh, thinking about, worrying about protest activities that may be occurring uh, in the next week or so, and wanting to know what UUC may be doing on that front and who else may be interested in it. We encourage you to go to that breakout group today after the service to share your concerns and to see who else uh, also has very similar ones. And then, of course, on Wednesday evening, uh, our midweek Vespers service at 7 o'clock, uh, the Reverend Beth and myself will uh, co-host that. And we have no idea, really, what it's going to be like. But it is certainly going to be an opportunity uh, for those of us to gather together and to remind each other that no one is alone and that there are positive and constructive things we can do uh, regardless of how all of that turns out. Let us begin the service this morning.
We gather today as a community of faith and we come in search of life's meaning. All of us have known despair and all of us have known exaltation and each of us bears our own particular burden. Each of us has moments of weakness and of strength and all sing songs of sorrow and of love. May this short hour bring us strength along our way. For in the presence of the sacred, may we come to know our truest selves and finding a fresh impulse to love again and to do good. Come, let us worship together. I invite you to join me now in singing the doxology, which you will find on your screen, and to continue with the opening hymn, Sound Over All Waters. We've begun the good custom here at University Unitarian Church to invite uh, members of the congregation, families, individuals, uh, beginning with the Board of Trustees and now branching out, uh, to share with us uh, some inner personal thoughts about what Unitarian Universalism means to them, what this congregation means to them. And we are delighted this morning to hear from Judith Wood and Cal Van Zee. Good morning. I'm Judith Wood. And I'm Cal Van Zee. We've been members of UUC for about 25 years. Our family has been nurtured, challenged, and sustained by this church community in many ways over that time. When we first joined, we were focused on a religious education for our three children, and we were grateful for an hour of intellectual stimulation with other adults. In spring of this year, when I received a cancer diagnosis, I knew the church would be there for me. Reverend John, Beth, and Bruce Davis helped me discover my new life. 
we have felt surrounded by care and love of so many here. We give to UUC because we want our church to be there for others as it has been for us. Please join us in saying our offertory words. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it.
I invite you now, dear friends, to join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation as we take a moment to quiet and center ourselves, seeking that which renews us as persons and as a people. Let it be our prayer this day to ask for certain things for this too much world. We know not what to pray except to ask for peace in it and justice for its people. We dare to ask for compassion and generosity among as many as will risk their private pursuits of the few to serve the public good of all. We dare to ask for wisdom to discern the larger good, gladness in seeking and serving it, and realization that since we are inescapably connected and bound to each other, we are also accountable for the beauty and care of this earthly life we share. We dare to ask for courage enough to take the small daily steps toward fulfilling a grand dream for us all that in so many ways we share with each other. And for ourselves we ask that in this world where there are at least two sides to everything, we might find quiet hearts hushed by trusting that finally all sides have some truth and some merit. And thus we dare to ask for a sense of freeing proportion in the awareness that not all sides are ours. We need guidance in choosing daily which side of what will receive the stubborn ounces of our weight. And then we dare to ask for the passion to commit those ounces to tip the scales toward justice and not be afraid to succeed in full or part or not at all, humility to engage in the human fray without dehumanizing ourselves or those who disagree with us. And we ask for joy in striving to do the much that depends on me in balance with the ease of confirming the infinitely more that depends only on all of us. These are some of the prayers and hopes and dreams we have this day. To now, which we add the silent intentions of our hearts and our minds. So may it be. Amen.
Friends, I'd like to start with a reading this morning. It comes from a book titled Achieving Our Country, and it was written by Richard Rorty, R-O-R-T-Y, who for many years taught philosophy at Stanford University, now deceased, but a pretty influential guy, at least on me. And this is what he said in that book. Stories about what a nation has been and should try to be are not attempts at accurate representation, but rather are attempts to forge a moral identity. The argument between left and right about which episodes in our history we Americans should pride ourselves on will never be a contest between true and a false account of our country's history and its identity. It is better described as an argument about which hopes to allow ourselves and which hopes to forego. As long as our country has a politically active right and a politically active left, this argument will continue. It is at the heart of the nation's political life, but the left is responsible for keeping it going. For the right never thinks that anything much needs to be changed. It thinks the country is basically in good shape and may well have been in better shape in the distant past. It sees the left's struggle for social justice as mere troublemaking, as utopian foolishness. The left, by definition, is the party of hope. It insists that our nation remains unachieved. Richard Rorty, Achieving Our Country. I have given as a title for my sermon this morning an election sermon, and what I am doing by uh, suggesting by doing so is remembering an old tradition in Massachusetts, the state in which I was born and, and grew up and where I was educated, where for 250 years between 1634 and 1884, a prominent clergyman, and it was a man at the time, uh, was invited to preach a sermon before the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, called the General Court, to open its session in May. It was the center of a ritual in which a community was to give thanks for its many blessings and to take stock of the nation, of the government. Actually, the exact words in the charter of the election sermon are to give thanks for the many great and distinguishing privileges, both civil and religious, which we are favored with, and to ask direction and a blessing from on high upon all the administration of government in the land." Close quote. We are now coming, hopefully, to the conclusion of what has been a very bruising uh, presidential election, pre-election activities for many months and just really a couple of years. Tuesday is the day in which many will vote and within some time, probably not Tuesday, we will have some result for which we can either rejoice or weep. All of us are anxious about this, of course, because the consequences are very large and very real. But given the way things have happened in the last couple of years, we also know that there is a totally unpredictable quality to all of this, and we won't know what we are going to live with until it actually shows its face to us sometime in the near future. So how do we prepare with all of our anxiety, all of our concern, all of our worry about so momentous an event which has such repercussions, not only for our lives, certainly, 
but for the lives of our children and actually for the status of the world. Well, more than 50 years ago, the psychologist Eric Erickson developed a conception of stages of the life cycle. And each of the stages had its own particular virtue and its own particular temptations. And this morning I will examine America and its political leadership in the light of such stages, especially the stages of adolescence, adulthood, and old age. According to Erickson, the challenge of adolescence is the establishment of identity and the hoped for outcome of achieving identity is the virtue of fidelity or faithfulness, a kind of faithfulness to one's obligations, to one's new sense of who one is. The challenge of adulthood is attaining the capacity to take responsibility for others, as well as for oneself, both for others and for oneself. And the hoped for virtue in this achievement would be the virtue of caring, that we actually become demonstrably caring persons. And the challenge of old age is to find meaning in the whole of life, in the face of one's imminent death or demise. And here, the hoped for virtue is the virtue of wisdom. Now we all know, of course, that life doesn't follow easily one stage after the other, and that these challenges and virtues are inherent throughout all of life's stages, but only become relatively prominent at particular points in the life cycle so that for each of these stages, these things seem to be paramount in that stage, but, but they happen also at other times as well. We all know wise children, and there are elders who have never been able to establish their own identity, and many persons in their whole lives have never learned how to take care of others, not only other people, but to take care of themselves and to take care of the environment, the world in which we live. But there seems to be one stage in which American culture finds itself permanently fixated, and that is adolescence. In many ways, adolescence is a very charming phase of life filled with enthusiasm and excitement and the willingness to take chances and risks, the ability to try new things, to be hopeful, most often in an untried way, so a sweet and naive kind of hopefulness, so innocent hopefulness. But the great American Bernard historian Bernard DeVoto reminded us in his numerous works that a country like America, which started for so much of its early life, exploring what it called new frontiers. For us, it's not surprising that there is a perpetually adolescent quality to American culture. And as those of you who have children, or those of you who remember your own adolescence know, there is a dark side and a really quite unpleasant side to adolescence. Remember, the challenge of adolescence is to establish one's identity, but the task is always threatened by identity confusion, by a chaos of feelings that include anxiety and depression and often express themselves objectively as hyperactivity and sullenness. There is always the temptation in adolescence to reach for what is known as ideological closure, 
to solve one's own personal identity crisis by identifying with a totally external ideological or religious system to give oneself wholly over to this outside system and to accept it uncritically as the only meaning and purpose of one's own life. And to add to the struggle and difficulty of this particular time, of course, is that there is no time in the life cycle of an individual where the peer group is more important than in adolescence. To be liked by others in your group, to never criticize your own group or your own peers. No time when one so clearly has to prove oneself by showing off, by being tougher, more daring, more glamorous, or whatever, than other people. And this is, of course, charming to other adolescents. It's actually reinforcing to other adolescents. But it isn't very charming, especially to adults. Now, I'm sure that as I give a brief description of the struggles of adolescence and the pitfalls of ideological closure, you are thinking of certain persons, not yourself, of course, that you would identify as stuck in adolescence. And I would wager to say, my friends, that all people of all religious, all political, all social groups have the same struggle. To the rest of the world, the charming side of adolescent culture has been enormously appealing. Some years ago now, Václav Havel, who was the president of the Czech Republic, gave the commencement address at Harvard University. And in the course of his remarks, he made this telling observation. He said, quote, one evening not long ago, I was sitting in an outdoor restaurant by the water my chair was almost identical to the chairs they have in restaurants by the river in Prague. They were playing the same rock music they play in most Czech restaurants. I saw advertisements I'm familiar with back home. Above all, I was surrounded by young people who were similarly dressed, who drank familiar looking drinks, and who behaved as casually as their contemporaries in Prague. Only their complexion and their facial features were different, for I was in Singapore." Close quote. Maybe what Havel is talking about here is the influence of one culture on another. But if you think about it, where if not from America did this rock music and familiar looking drinks and clothes and even casual behavior originate. Informality and individuality are American trademarks, but so are consumerism and mass entertainment and the ideology of the free market. There is almost no major city in the world where a scene such as Havel described, could not be found. And yet, the very same people who are charmed by our films, our rock music, our casual manners so much that they want to imitate them, happen also to be appalled by our bullying by our claim to be the best, richest, strongest nation on the earth, and that the rest of the world ought to shape up and be like us or face the consequences, the not at all charming side of adolescence. Back in April, Fintan O'Toole who writes for the Irish Times in Dublin, a literary critic, drama critic, in Ireland and in New York, wrote a piece in which he claimed 
that for the first time in world history, America was to be pitied for its corrupt and incompetent leadership, most notably evident in the mishandling of the coronavirus. That for centuries, people look up to America as the beacon, as the star to follow, as the culture to imitate. We see it all over the world, but for the first time, according to him and to others, we were to be pitied for our leadership, pitied for the many who followed it, and pitied for the many who did not. Because we often seem so stuck in adolescence, it is not surprising that so is it the case with so many of our leaders. Each having his or her own way, being more interested in providing how, proving how wonderfully charming or strong they are in caring for the environment of the world. And the adolescent public tends to vote for the most adolescent leaders because they see in them themselves and they live vicariously through that kind of myth. And as a result, we have a huge deficit when it comes to adults in our society. And thus we lack on a grand scale the virtue of caring. We see this all over of late in our own national culture. It seems so uncaring of others, so dismissive of the values of the environment, so hateful of other people, so demeaning of human beings, born and unborn, you see, no caring at all. And it may be that the last president who exhibited this kind of caring, who seemed to be an adult, I'm guessing is probably Jimmy Carter, who in his own term was considered weak and overly thoughtful and reflective. Perhaps too we might include Barack Obama in this assessment, but different than Jimmy Carter. Obama on a more serene level was caring, but he surely was. The most urgent need then in our own society is to develop a culture of caring more than anything else to try to build an inclusive community concerned with the great issues that face all of us in the world, global warming, global poverty, and the needs of billions of people who are left out who are, or are barely hanging on in the whirlwind of widespread rapid social change and many and many of them in our own country. Of course, to be caring, one has to have the capacity to see oneself in other people, to be able to say that another person's pain is really also m my pain, and that another person's joy or opportunity are our joy and our opportunity. Let us not be among those who are too busy to be concerned for others to be hostages of our own anxiety and hyperactivity and the accompanying sullenness to even remember that other people have needs. Even the people we dislike have needs. Neglect is the opposite of caring and our society shows dangerous signs of neglect at every level. But I would advocate, even against all of our political prejudices, that we cannot develop a culture of caring, that we will not even know what really needs caring for, unless we have something like wisdom, 
a perspective that dwarfs all our limited loyalties. Very hard to find today when so many of the grand narratives of human history and human experience have been discredited. And most people are long in search for a story they can belong to that is their own story, as C.K. Williams once said. We need a kind of wisdom now, no matter at what stage of life any of us is in. And what is that? What might it look like? Well, Eric Erickson gave a preliminary definition of it. I'm sure you have your own. I would like to hear what it is, if you do have one of your own. Erickson said that wisdom is detached concern with life itself in the face of death itself. Wisdom is detached concern for life itself in the face of death itself itself. That's a pretty profound observation, I think, and probably hard for many of us to understand. I think one of the key words in the definition, though, is detached. The very last thing it means is neglect or disinterest. Rather, I think it is a kind of objectivity capable of great and abiding interest. That's what detachment means to me. It means giving up our anxieties and our petulance and obstinance and opening ourselves quietly and unhurriedly to what is really there. Only then might we attain a larger perspective and a critical distance that will allow us to discover what needs to be done, and what is really possible to do. When I was in high school, I had the great privilege and joy of studying Latin for four years. OK, I've just confirmed what a geek I am, but I loved studying Latin. And by our senior year, we were reading and memorizing the speeches of Cicero I recall one of these speeches in which Cicero recounts a dream of the great Roman politician and general, Scipio. And in the dream, Scipio meets his ancestors in the highest heaven where they now dwelt. And he says, Scipio says, when I gazed in every direction from that point all else appeared wonderfully beautiful. There were stars which we never see from the earth, and they were all larger than we have ever imagined. The starry spheres were much larger than the earth. Indeed, the earth itself seemed to me so small that I was scornful of our empire, which covers only a single point as it were, upon the surface of a great globe. Scipio's vision shows the insignificance of the Roman Empire, for which he bore heavy political and military responsibility. And in his dream, he asks his father if he might immediately join him in this heavenly realm in order to escape. But his father tells him that the only way to get there is to carry out his earthly duties, but to do so with the vision of the heavens, to look for stars he had not yet seen so that he would never forget the relative significance of everything. I think Rorty was talking about the same thing in a very different idiom and in a contemporary way. He was talking about the vision of an ideal which is as yet unachieved. 
that we count desperately on those persons who believe that democracy is yet an ideal, unachieved, and that there must be constant effort in trying to get there. Cicero's overwhelming emphasis on the majesty of the eternal and the relative insignificance of the transient means that even though he doesn't lose sight of the relationship between moral action on earth and one's eternal fate, his sense of the beauty of the stars yet unseen and his scorn for the insignificance of his empire, one of the greatest empires in human history, are intended to communicate the power of a vision, of a vision that puts our reality and our world in true perspective by finding a higher standard by which to assess the significance of our own limited one. Cicero is not the only one to have had this insight in the long drama of human history. We find this wisdom in every great religious tradition. In Buddhism, whose essence is non-clinging, non-attachment, even non-attachment to non-attachment, we might tell the Zen story of the master who tells his student to climb a 100-foot pole. And when the student reached the top of the pole, he asked his master, now what do I do? Climb 10 feet higher, says the master. In essence, there is not one thing to which one can cling. In the Christian tradition, one could say when a person has failed at every attempt to save him or herself, one finally recognizes that there is only something called grace that only in losing oneself will one find oneself. By shedding the me, one is embraced by a love that will not let us go, as the old hymn says. In the Stoic tradition, the late flower of ancient Greece that probably exerted more influence on Christianity than any other strand of the classical tradition, we are admonished not to cling to what they called the pathé, P-A-T-H-E, pathé, not to cling to the pathé, the irrational motions of the soul, the fears and desires that dominate and control so much of our days and nights. The Stoic ideal was apatheia, for which the English word apathy is a completely misleading translation. For Stoicism did not, any more than Christianity or Buddhism or Cicero, advocate escapism from the problems of the world. For all of them, the only meaning we can find will come through vigorous and virtuous participation in the societies in which we live and measuring that participation against the highest dream or hope that calls us and summons us into being. Not withdrawal into a private world. And I suggest to us that the vision so many of us are most worried about today and have been for some time is the vision of what democracy might be in its truest sense because we have not seen it yet. We have not seen it yet. What these traditions suggest to us is that we are not independent of our context, nor is the truth to be found, our truth to be found in ourselves. A human being is extensive, not intensive, defined by many relationships, by its place in the natural world, not apart from it. And this in no way implies conformity and the loss of identity, but it does imply that one's obligation to nature or God or heaven or democracy may entail actions 
that will place us in stark tension with one's environment, even at the hazard of one's own life. There is no rejection of society as such, but only a loving criticism of its disorder. We are called to do what we can to bring order into society so that our social obligations and our ultimate obligations are harmonious. Wisdom teaches a wider view of the whole set of obligations and a proper evaluation of one's own place in it. This is not a distraction from our responsibility to care, but is a deepening of it, a wider understanding. Erickson's definition of wisdom as detached concern with life itself in the face of death itself is really a deeper concern with life rather than being overwhelmed, controlled by one's fear, one's anxiety, one's dependence on the perfect outcome. But let me conclude with one last warning. The quest for wisdom has a dark side, just as all stages of life do. And the dark temptation, the all too easy answer in the search for wisdom is to despair and to be disgusted at the status of things. The call to wisdom requires that we see the world as it is, difficult, brutal, harsh, beautiful, resplendent, transcendent, all of it, not to be co-opted by the dark and the negative side of it, but to see it with open eyes and to embrace it and to walk into it on behalf of something that is even bigger than that itself, you see. As we look at the world today, as we look at this presidential election cycle, soon to come to a close, mercifully, a cycle in which hope has been championed, even as the storm clouds have grown greatly more ominous, we can feel close to a precipice asking ourselves if irreversible changes have been set in motion that will carry all of us over the edge. And we fear not only for ourselves, but we fear for our children. We fear for life itself. So extreme is it. And yet these traditions I have alluded to this morning would say that just when we fear the, mo the worst, we most need the capacity to look at life realistically objectively, lovingly. We may need to dream the dream of Scipio and see that our empire is as fleeting as the great powers that have gone before us. There have been many dark times in human history. And maybe we may also dream that our country is as yet unachieved. Michael Beschloss, the presidential historian, said, today we have seen just how far someone with a lust for power and contempt for democracy can go within our system. Never has the expression eternal vigilance is the price of liberty been more res resonant. And we have to go back to the founding period and demand of our government that it become the best that it can be. And we must commit ourselves to this not with bitterness, but with hope and expectation. So let us face the coming challenges calmly and with detachment, doing what can be done with what we have in the time we have, faithfully, lovingly, and wisely, and not for ourselves alone but for the world's sake. For the future's sake. For our children. And our sacred honor. May we be empowered by a glimpse of stars we have yet to see. Amen.
Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 295. Sing out praises for the journey. Now, therefore, since the struggle deepens, since evil abides and good does not yet prosper, let us gather what strength we have, what confidence and valor, that our small victories may end in triumph and the world awaited become a world attained. So may it be. Amen.